We all know Isaac Newton as the father of modern physics. He formulated the law of universal gravity, built the first reflecting telescope, and split the white light into a spectrum with a lens. Amid all these achievements, one short article written by Newton in 1695 gets a bit lost. Its title is On the Amendment of English Coins. In the late 17th century, England was suffering from devastating depreciation of its primary coin, silver shilling. Back then, money was molded from pure metal and some dishonest citizens would cut the edges of the coins off. Moreover, counterfeiters would put coins with impurities into use. Low-quality coins comprised about 95% of money in circulation. The English coin needed to have its value back so that the inflation could be stopped. First Lord of the Treasury Charles Montagu was the one to solve that problem. Just like Newton, he graduated from Trinity College in Cambridge. He happened to notice that article, and he was so impressed that he offered Newton the position of Warden of the Royal Mint. And you know what? Newton, age 57, said yes. He created a network of branches of mint across the whole country, withdrew all the bad coins from circulation and minted the new ones all of the same weight and fineness. Nothing could threaten the country's money standard anymore. Why would I even tell you that? Whilst looking for stories for this podcast, we were constantly bumping into scientists who left science for something else. Namely, to sell lab-grown meat, to create biodegradable shoes, to consult think tanks, or to work for the government. And if you think about it, these cases are much more impressive than Newton's shift. Just listen. In the 17th century, when Newton lived, scientists were universal specialists who could study everything they were interested in, from chemistry to history and in the meantime sit in the parliament and write philosophical tracts lying in a bathtub. Whereas now, being a man of science means being a domain specialist who spends years of hard work on mastering some particular skill on some very limited area of knowledge. And at the same time, most of today's PhD students won't even become professors at universities. We'll probably return to the stories of particular shifts of particular scientists in later episodes. But for now the question is, what's up with all that mass exodus of scientists happening right now? And welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov and I'm your host. In this podcast, we discuss stories of professionals from different spheres, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. And today we'll talk about how and why scientists migrate en masse to the world of business yet unknown to them. The guests of this episode have not only faced such challenge themselves, but also used their experience to help their ex-colleagues with a career switch. And before we get into it, I have a little favor to ask. Please subscribe, rate, and leave reviews wherever you're listening to Control Shift. It will help more people to discover it. And now, to the story. What does an academic career look like today? It's a long, exhausting marathon. Four years of bachelor's degree, two years of master's, four to six years of research, articles publication and conference talks to get a PhD. And then you become a postdoc. And that's where your adventure starts. 
Now you have to supervise other students and look for grants to support your research. That's going to last for the next 20, 30 or even 40 years. All this time you're going to focus on a very specific topic, which is interesting to a very small group of enthusiasts. Moreover, to get tangible results as soon as possible, you should figure out the subject of the research really early. It's also essential to have a clear-cut plan for your research, which you can stick to in the following 5 to 10 years. Long story short, the academic career demands that people become genius time managers at the age of 20. But what if you get your PhD or your master's degree and suddenly realize that scientific research is not your cup of tea? Oops. As I got further and further in my career, I realized I don't want to be the person doing the science. So I went to my advisor, Dr. Math, and I said to him, what can I do with a career, for a career with a degree in mathematics, besides become a professor, a teacher, or go into actuarial studies? And he literally turned to me and used the word nothing to describe my career prospects. This is Alina Levy. Initially, Alina entered Arizona University to become a theoretical astrophysicist and watch the stars. One day, in the middle of the student practice, it suddenly struck her that she's up to her ears in data analysis. But there are actually no stars in her studies. So, Alina changed her learning path. She switched to maths and, drumroll, anthropology. The explanation behind this choice is simple. She really liked both. But it's not a square peg in a round hole. Actually, there can be a place for such a combination in academia. Elena even managed to receive a grant to study ancient Egyptian mathematics in Cairo. That was an amazing experience. Her favorite job, a new country, a new language. But only Elena realized that she didn't see herself in science. As soon as she came back from Cairo, she sought career advice from her advisor and got that nothing reply. And basically, it looked like no one asked these kind of questions but her. I saw a lot of my friends who were in physics or in mathematics seemingly know exactly what they wanted to do. They were very, very outwardly confident. So they were going on to graduate school. They were getting really amazing fellowships. They had an idea that they're going to be a professor. And I felt, wait a second, I, I don't know. I, I, I even felt jealous of them that I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and my career. And they do. Yeah, this doesn't sound too good to me. But here's the deal. Some of those self-confident and I got everything planned people, whom young Elena was jealous of, those very people will seek her advice years later. And do you know what they will ask? Yep. How to build a career outside of science. Today, Elena Levine is a career consultant for scientists, an author of Networking for Nerds, public speaker and, as she calls herself, corporate comedian. And now researchers seek her consultation on their career paths. It just all kind of happened. After graduating from the uni, Elena started looking for a job and applied for a position in her physics department. She became the director of communications and, while responding to the questions and complaints from students and applicants, Elena realized that science communications is a career. I realized, wait a second, I can actually help my students get jobs in industry. And I realized if I can help my students, I can probably help others. And that's when I realized this is a business that I can create in helping other people build your unicorn career. That's how Elena became a career consultant. Her business is thriving. It turns out that every other scientist at a certain point considers a career change. Just compare. In 1960s, half of the scientists left the field after 35 years of work. In 2010s, the period of their research career went down to five years. But why? Of course, the science has changed a lot over the last few decades. Publication policy, funding, reduction of the numbers of tenure positions, increasing bureaucratization and specialization, toxic atmosphere, etc, etc, etc. In short, 
You come into science to become a new Darwin or Durkheim. Instead, you end up working for scraps and thinking about how to publish enough articles and prove that your work is even worth funding. And most likely, you are not doing something that you really enjoy. Another thing could be that in the process of getting their PhD or doing their postdoc, that process, as you know, takes a lot out of a person. It can take four to six years for the PhD, two years or more for a postdoc. And if you do multiples, we're going on to many, many years. And most likely, you're pursuing a very, very narrow project. So you may have gotten into science because you want to um, clarify our understanding of the universe. But in getting your PhD, because you're only working on a very, very small corner of that universe, you began to realize maybe this isn't for me. Okay, many people don't like academia, that's understandable. But people with academic backgrounds are in demand in so many fields. Consulting, state departments of science policy, scientific communication, think tanks, nonprofits, charity funds, pharmaceutical, biotech, and even journalism. It doesn't look like lack of opportunities, so what's the problem? Career change is not a big deal, or is it? Come on, just imagine. You communicate only with scientists and most likely even with the same people from a couple of unis and labs. You read the same journals, meet at conferences, apply for the same grants. All in all, it's a closed community that lives by its own code. And now you have to leave it all and go out into the world where no one cares about how many people cited your last year article. No one knows your scientific advisor, and you can hardly meet anyone capable of understanding the heading of your thesis. So a typical scenario, um, and this is a standard type of situation with my coaching clients, they come to me, let's say they've only they've gotten a PhD in chemistry, and they're a chemistry professor, or maybe they've just finished their postdoctoral associate uh, position as a chemist, and they're thinking that they want to do something in industry, and they apply for jobs, and they don't get any interviews. And when we look at their documents, their resume, their cover letter, uh, the, the way they, they market themselves, they're only talking about their chemistry skills. They're only talking about what they do with chemistry and with chemicals. In actuality, scientists have an entire suite, an entire portfolio of other skills besides those in their scientific discipline. They have business skills, they have leadership, communications, team building, conflict resolution. And if you're going to work outside of academia, you have to not only market the chemistry or the science skills, but you have to market those business skills it's no easy shift after all, as it requires a serious change in your worldview. Goals, values, and standards are completely different here. And actually, you already have everything you need. One small thing is lacking. You should sell your skills. Elena has got a favorite example for that. She has a friend, a professor of particle physics, who worked in one of the US-based universities. His wife was a food scientist in Campbell's Soup Company. So the spouses were constantly apart because they had to work in different cities. They just couldn't find jobs in one and the same location. So one day this physics professor flies up to the city where his wife works and he has dinner with his wife and some of the executives from the factory where they made the soup. And over dinner, they were complaining about a problem they had in the factory. And it had to do with making sure that the soup, every can of soup, when you open it, has exactly the same color to it. So when you make, for example, mushroom soup, if you had uh, mushrooms that could change the outcome of the final product, then the final product on one batch could be blue, another one could be purple, another one could be orange because of the different shades of the mushrooms. So the complaint that they had over for dinner was how do we figure out which mushrooms are going to change the outcome of the final product and then remove them from the factory floor. And this was a difficult problem for them to solve. But over dinner, the physicist hears them talking about this and shares an idea of using a certain type of optical device that he had in his lab. And it led to him actually getting a job, more specifically having a job created for him at the Campbell's Soup Company 
factory where he could actually take his physics background and apply it to problems in the factory to solve them in a new and novel and innovative way. And so he was able to finally live with his wife. So that was wonderful. And he was able to build this career in Campbell's in a soup company, even though he had no experience with soup other than eating it. As scientists, you are not trained to work to business people. And you do not discuss with business people without any scientific training, as you could discuss with scientists. So you should learn to have a straight-to-the-point message. I often say that you should learn to speak as you could speak to a child. If a child understands what you say, everyone could understand that you say. And it's a challenge for a pure scientist at the beginning. This is Jerome Bredow. Doctor of Neurobiology and Specialist in Neurodegenerative Diseases. Jerome worked in Henry Mondor Hospital. In 2016, Jerome developed the first animal model, which accurately replicates the course of Alzheimer's disease, and particularly the pre-dementia phase. In other words, he learned to induce a state in mice, which is very similar to the state of human body 20 years before dementia symptoms begin to show. With the help of this model, it's possible to predict the disease, diagnose it at a very early stage, and therefore potentially cure it. So, Jerome patented this model. However, he saw the conditions inside scientific institutes as too limiting. His goal was not only to make a discovery, but to make sure it reaches real people and actually helps them. It meant that he needed to start a business and introduce the product to the market. So the way of working in the private and public environment is totally different. In the public environment, you didn't have any deadline, you didn't have any problem of time, but you've got some problem of funding. In the private, it's the inverse. So you didn't have any problem of funding. So finally, you could obtain some money. You have a limited duration to realize your experimentation. So I decided to finally jump to the private company and launch a private company to accelerate the development of the diagnosis in order to give this tool to the patient earlier. So Jerome founded a startup agent T that develops the first blood diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But surprise, surprise, one excellent product is not enough to make a successful startup. So the main issue, especially for scientists as me, is that to acquire the concept of business because we are not trained to realize business, to generate contract or to build detailed budgets. That's why I decided to find an associate that is a pure business guy to complete my background with a pure business background. You must admit, it's a smart move. Jerome is responsible for technical aspects and scientific vision, and his business partner Baptiste Beloir runs all the business issues. So instead of exploring the nuances of doing business from scratch, all Jerome had to do was to make sure that business and science talk the same language. As a result, AGT got angel investment, sponsorship from France Alzheimer Association, and grant money. But what if you don't have a friend who, by a lucky coincidence, understands both science and business, and is looking for an occupation, and is eager to become your partner? And if you are a full-time scientist and you are not ready to dive into business, but interested in a side job, what happens then? It is not bad necessarily that academics don't have this business acumen because that's if they would have this as well, they their brains <laughs> wouldn't blow. This is Maria Shutova. She's a treasure huntress. But you know, in science. The hidden gems she's looking for are recent scientific discoveries that need just a bit of investment to take off. But let's start from the beginning. Maria got her PhD on stem cells in Moscow. After that, she went to Toronto to continue her postdoc research and added bioinformatics to genetics and stem cells. She spent three years there. 
It was about time to go back to Russia, but she already knew that it wasn't an option. And so, like, doing science in Russia, it was not as easy as you can imagine, because, like, science is international, and there is a lot of small-ish and very, very expensive things you cannot produce yourself. And it is also pretty possible that it's not produced somewhere nearby, so you would have to order it from abroad. And like so then science in, in Russia was a lot of bureaucracy of getting grants, then getting this money on your account, and then basically trying to, 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 to spend all this money, you know, in two months, just because like bureaucracy before um, halted the whole process and now it's December <laughs> you have to you have to spend all the money and then you will have to wait for months and months to, to get your reagents and this is like I think it's visible <laughs> it's not it's not the surrounding you, you want to be Maria liked it better in Toronto but she realized that she doesn't fancy an academic career even there still I realized that I'm not a genius and you have to admit this at one point in your life. And I think in my mind, I should have been a genius in order to do science. I didn't want to be just normal, good enough scientist who would spend the whole life in the lab. And I guess I had this in me that I, I, I wanted to see the results of what I'm doing, visible results, not, not as a you know line on the, the, the PCR. <laughs> Maria began to contemplate where to go next. It felt almost as an identity crisis. Where can you go as a scientist with expertise in bioinformatics methods and pluripotent stem cells technologies? Let's take a second and think what her opportunities were. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Her skill set included working in a lab, being able to read scientific literature, she had decent level of English, good analytical skill, and a reasonable network in science. Yeah, I too couldn't come up with anything. Neither could she. Literally nothing but a job at McDonald's came to her mind. But then... But then I went to a real nice workshop on commercialization of research. And basically, they, they described every single step of like within this commercialization path. And I realized that I like the investments part because it's kind of like digging for gems. And you have to use all, all of your scientific background in order to speak with these academics, try to ask the right questions, to see the perspective, to, to, see this, like, to, to figure out the strategy. And so with this knowledge, I went to the nearest venture specialist I, I knew of, who was my classmate in university. <laughs> and it turns out that he has a fund and he asked me to join. And to me, it was a big transition to real life, I guess, because I feel like in academia, we are all in this great amazing camp <laughs> where we are allowed to do whatever we want, how we want. Not that much freedom. Of course, we have grants to write and of course we have to, like, to do a lot of boring stuff, <laughs> but still. Maria found a job in a venture fund for BioCapital. She worked in this fund for two and a half years and then left it for a nonprofit named Coal and Gene Therapy Catapult. For those who don't have a PhD, myself included, self-therapy aims to treat diseases by restoring or altering certain sets of cells, or by using cells to carry therapy through the body. Cells are cultivated or modified outside the body before being injected into the patient. The cells may originate from the patient or a donor. Gene therapy aims to treat diseases by replacing, inactivating or introducing genes into cells, either inside or outside the body. Some therapies are considered both cell and gene therapies. They work by altering genes in specific types of cells and inserting them into the body of patient. Long story short, gene and cell therapy is the cutting edge of science. If you think about what excites the minds of scientists all over the world now, where major scientific breakthroughs happen and world-changing technologies are developed, gene and cell therapy is one of these fields. 
but it's a long way to make a real change in the world, from a brilliant idea born in a closed lab to a workable technology accessible to people. And in the first place, it's necessary to drag this idea through investors who will allocate money for the completion of this technology. That's what cell and gene therapy catapult does. And it is the goal of all of us is to help academics to grow, become like new companies, the biotech, and eventually reach the market, uh, reach clinical trials and reach the patients, which is even more important than the market. And so our goal is to, to fill this void between being an, an academic with a bright, perfect new idea, which can help millions, possibly, and this place where investors are giving you money for the the first clinical trials and this is actually a void because like you as an academic you don't have to have any knowledge on necessarily what to do with it <laughs> and so we have different perspectives in our team and so we have brilliant people who knows everything about the preclinical trials what to do with mice what to do with tissues cells and stuff we have a like senior scientist really bright young woman who works on like technical part of things. That sounds like a masterclass in pitching. The team listens to scientists presenting their work and bombards them with questions off the top of their heads. Then they take a break, discuss, do some research and go for the second round with deeper and more detailed questions. As for Marie, she helps scientists to plan commercialization of their products and communicate with investors. Because frankly, most scientists haven't seen investors other than from afar and have no clue on how to deal with them. The result of this work is a report, a thorough plan of action. And if this plan is approved by the committee, then the collaboration starts. It takes only a year or two for the scientists to reach the first round of venture investments. After that, they can start their own company, meaning taking their discovery's fate into their own hands. Well, this story might sound too specific to be relatable, but first of all, if an astrophysicist slash mathematician slash anthropologist and a stem cell specialist could make a career change without starting from scratch, I bet you can too. And most importantly, this problem is more common than it seems. For example, within digital design career, we designers do not lead an almost monastic life as scientists do, we're just an ordinary professional community, and we make the same mistakes. We sell ourselves only through our technical skills. Now, my friends at Humble Team recently went down on a hiring spree. Their HR reviewed something like 800 CVs and cover letters in one go, and almost all of them looked like this, blah blah blah, I work in Figma, can do a bit of animation and simple illustrations. And remember that Humble Team is a digital product design agency that helps startups and enterprises to create and grow their digital products and brands. And let's take a typical task. Let's say there is a banking app that is consistently losing 8% of its users. That's almost one-tenth of its entire user base. And if it continues to go down this way, there will be no one left just after a year. Obviously, something has to be done. And this specific task does not necessarily connect an average designer's mind to their core skill set. Just look at your next top 10 UX UI solutions article. You'll be advised with the latest trends in icon design and dark mode patterns. But it's very clear that even a hundred new beautiful icons or shiny UI facelifts won't halt the trend completely. Instead, it's crucial to understand the root of the problem. Maybe the leaving users just spend their balance and there is nothing else to keep them in the app anymore. So maybe the app would need to push an attractive credit line in order to regain users' focus. So this is only an extra step in design process. Now, from these 800 applicants, only like 10 people would mention their skills that would help them solve these kind of product design tasks. Let's reflect a bit ourselves on it. Are we looking at our skills and experience in a narrow way? Are we being stopped from achieving something bigger? Or just having a good time? 
Control Shift was brought to you by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. Music for this episode was created by Kiri Weinstein and also special thanks to Blue Dot Session. The song you heard in the beginning, Pose Doc Me Now, was written by a group of PhD students. We left the link to the full version in the description. Also, you can find there the names of everybody who worked on this episode. And I'm your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in two weeks.